Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1173 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission's new application fee schedule is unlikely to go into effect before 2022. We will have all the details. The Hurricane WatchNet has its eyes on Hurricane Grace and is planning activations this weekend for a tropical storm on Re as it approaches the New England states. The Radio Club of Haiti reports significant structural damage and loss of life from the recent earthquake and it is asking amateurs to keep certain HF frequencies clear. We will have the specifics. It's time to get set for the SET. The ARRL simulated emergency test is coming up soon. The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Intruder Watch is reporting a new burst signal coming from China as intruders on the amateur low bands continue to increase. We will have an updated addition to the July Volunteer Monitor Report NASA is seeking student technical ideas for future suborbital launches. And Bell Labs has proven the existence of what it calls dark suckers. All of this and a lot more is straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be saying happy birthday, happy 40th birthday, actually, with a retrospective look back at the original IBM PC. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us about what he calls being an equipment custodian. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill goes back to the beginning of amateur radio and takes a look at the early days of Spark and the development in the early days of radio. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will give us some general antenna mounting tips. And all of that and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes over the airwaves right now. Reporting from a very nondescript building here at our headquarters studio in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we're dodging a few hurricanes coming up the coast, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Well, the rain has finally stopped again. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where I'm beginning to long for the temperatures of October, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it's been warm, but after all, it is summer. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. We have late-breaking news as we come to air this week. The Hurricane Watch Net is mustering as Hurricane Grace, a Category 1 storm with maximum sustained winds of 85 miles per hour, is expected to make landfall between Tuxpam and Veracruz, Mexico. The storm swept over the Yucatan Peninsula yesterday. We plan to be activated on Friday afternoon at 2100 UTC on 14.325 MHz and continue on this frequency until we lose propagation, HWN manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV said. We will start up on 7.268 MHz at 2300 UTC and continue for as long as we have propagation. The National Hurricane Center says Grace has maximum sustained winds of nearly 90 miles per hour with higher gusts, strengthening its forecast until the storm makes landfall. 
Graves said that once attention shifts away from Grace, it will zero in on Tropical Storm Henri, which is expected to make landfall in New England on Sunday. As of Friday at 1800 UTC, Henri was almost a hurricane, according to the National Hurricane Center. We will announce activation plans for Henri as soon as possible, Graves said. Eastern Massachusetts Section Emergency Coordinator Rob Macedo, KD1CY, has announced that Eastern Massachusetts Aries was placed on standby on Friday. Macedo noted in mid-afternoon that WX4NHC at the National Hurricane Center already was on the air to gather weather data via amateur radio. The Boston Norton National Weather Service Office will be the primary agency during Henri for any Sky One-related activity. VOIP, Hurricane Net, and New England Sky One regional operations will be combined to form one large network as done in past major hurricane systems such as Irene and Sandy, Macedo said. Information from Aries Sky One will be shared with other agencies including state and federal emergency management, Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and media outlets, Macedo added. We will coordinate with the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. At 1800 UTC on Friday, Henri was 320 miles south-southeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and 720 miles south of Montauk Point, New York. Henri is headed north-northwest at 6 miles per hour, bearing winds of 70 miles per hour. Storm surge and hurricane watches are in effect for portions of the northeastern U.S. A hurricane watch is in effect for the south shore of Long Island from Fire Island Inlet to Montauk the north shore of Long Island from Port Jefferson Harbor to Montauk, New Haven, Connecticut, to Sagamore Beach, Massachusetts, and Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and Block Island. A turn toward the north is expected by tonight, and Henri is forecast to accelerate in that direction through early Sunday, the National Hurricane Center said. On the forecast track, Henri is expected to make landfall in southern New England by late Sunday. Additional strengthening is forecast into the weekend, and the National Hurricane Center expects Henri to be a hurricane by Saturday and be at or near hurricane strength when it makes landfall in southern New England. And now with our lead story this week, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, it was announced this week that the new schedule of FCC amateur radio application fees likely will not go into effect before 2022. To bring us up to date with all the latest details on the new FCC fees, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. FCC staff confirmed during a recent virtual meeting with volunteer examiner coordinators that the agency is still working on the necessary changes to the Universal Licensing System, ULS, software and elsewhere that must be in place before it starts collecting the fees from HAMS. The FCC now estimates the fees won't go into effect until early next year. Once effective, a $35 application fee will apply to new, modified, that's upgrade and sequential call sign change, renewal and vanity call sign applications. All fees will be per application. It won't cost you anything to change your name, mailing or email address. Volunteer examiner teams will not have to collect the $35 fee. Once the FCC application fee goes into effect, new and upgrade applicants will pay the exam session fee to the VE team as usual, but they'll pay the $35 application fee directly to the FCC using what's called the FCC Pay Fees System. The FCC will email a link to the applicant's license grant. The FCC no longer provides printed licenses. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. When the FCC receives the examination information from the VEC, it will email a link with payment instructions to each successful candidate who will then have 10 days from the date of the email to pay. After the fee is paid and the FCC has processed an application, examinees will receive a second email from the FCC with a link to their official license. The link will be good for 30 days. Licensees also will be able to view, download, and print official license copies by logging into their FCC ULS account. The FCC no longer provides printed licenses.
Licensees can log into the Universal Licensing System with their 10-digit FCC registration number, or FRN, and password at any time to view and manage their license and application, print their license, and update anything in their FCC license record, including adding an email address. In the immediate aftermath of the magnitude 7.2 earthquake on August 14th, Radio Club of Haiti President Jean-Robert Galliard, HH2JR, reported significant structural damage in the region. It is known that hams were helping to distribute medicine and supplies and aiding with transportation when possible. The 1229 UTC quake occurred some 20 miles east-northeast of Lacay and 7 miles northeast of San Luis de Sud on the end of Hispaniola that's closest to Cuba. The quake was about 80 miles west of Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. We will stay alert, said IARU Region 2 Emergency Coordinator Carlos Alberto Santa Maria Gonzalez, CO2JC. Haiti also found itself this week in the direct path of Tropical Depression Grace, which could aggravate the recovery effort by dumping flooding rains over portions of Haiti and westward, according to the National Hurricane Center. In addition to flash flooding, the rain could cause mudslides on Hispaniola to continue. The hurricane watch net has remained on alert level 2, monitoring mode, and is not currently active. Tropical Depression Fred was bringing rainfall across the Florida panhandle. Bill Hoops, K3WJH, an ARRL member in Pennsylvania who is with Southern Baptist Disaster Relief, reported that the U.S. Coast Guard is flying injured people to hospitals that are open. Some radio amateurs volunteer with Southern Baptist Disaster Relief, which has been working through red tape to gain permission to assist in Haiti. Hoops said he continues patiently monitoring HF in Pennsylvania, but had not been hearing anything from Haiti. The United States had sent a search and rescue team to Haiti to help locate victims. The island nation of 11 million, which shares Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic, has yet to fully recover from a disastrous earthquake in 2010 that devastated much of Port-au-Prince. Patients already was wearing thin when the quake hit, with Haitians struggling with the coronavirus, gang violence, grinding poverty, and the July 7th assassination of President Jovenel Moise. According to various media reports, by August 18th, the death toll had climbed past 2,000 and was expected to continue to rise. Jean Robert said, I am afraid the worst is yet to happen. Survivors sought shelter in tents, while search and rescue teams continued to dig through rubble for survivors and additional victims. Medical care and even basic supplies have been reported scarce in the quake zone, and some injured survivors have been airlifted to Port-au-Prince. Seismologists say the quake occurred six or seven miles below ground and was felt as far away as Jamaica, some 200 miles distant. In a statement received by ARRL on August 14, 2021, Region 2 of the International Amateur Radio Union has requested that radio amateurs in the Americas keep the following frequencies clear to support emergency communications in Haiti, 3750, 7150, and 14330 kHz. The statement came from IARU R2 Emergency Coordinator Carlos Alberto Santa Maria Gonzalez CO2JC. According to preliminary information from the United States Geological Survey, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti on August 14, 2021 at 1229 UTC, about 12 kilometers northeast of San Luis de Sud and 33 kilometers to the east-northeast of Lake Hay, Haiti. 18.352 degrees north and 73.4801 degrees west at a depth of 10 kilometers. Mr. Jean-Robert Gallard, HH2JR, president of the Radio Club of Haiti, reported significant structural damage. International News reports of high casualties. Those frequencies once again are 3750, 7150 and 14330 kHz. After activating on Wednesday, August 18th, the Hurricane Watchnet scrapped plans to reactivate the next morning as Hurricane Grace made a pre-sunrise landfall on the Yucatan Peninsula. 
bringing strong winds and heavy rain before moving out over the Gulf of Mexico. The Hurricane Watch Net previously announced plans to activate on Wednesday, August 18th and Friday, August 20th after Tropical Storm Grace attained Category 1 hurricane status. Air Force Reserve and NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft determined that Grace had become a hurricane just west of Grand Cayman Island. We still expect Grace to make another landfall late Friday evening or early Saturday morning, Hurricane Watch Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said. Looking ahead to the final landfall, unless something drastically changes, we'll plan to activate Friday afternoon at 2100 UTC on 14.325 megahertz, Graves said. After moving over the southwestern Gulf of Mexico early Friday, Grace is expected to make its second landfall somewhere between Tuxpan and Veracruz, Mexico, just before sunrise on Saturday. This storm could make as many as three landfalls, Graves noted, and if Grace hits the island of Cozumel before reaching the mainland of Mexico, a hurricane warning is in effect for the Yucatan Peninsula from Cancun to Punta Herrero, including Cozumel. Observed ground truth weather data from amateur radio volunteers in affected areas can aid forecasters at the National Hurricane Center. The National Hurricane Center was predicting that Hurricane Grace would follow a west to northwest to westward motion for the next several days. Some additional strengthening was expected before the storm center reached the eastern Yucatan Peninsula before weakening over land. Grace was expected to regain strength as it moves over the southwestern Gulf of Mexico on Friday. Hurricane force winds extend outward of 25 miles from the storm center, and tropical storm force winds extend outward up to 115 miles. The primary AWRL sponsored national emergency exercise is designed to assess the skills and preparedness of amateur radio emergency service volunteers, as well as those affiliated with other organizations involved with emergency and disaster response. The primary set weekend is October 2nd and 3rd but local and section-wide exercises may take place throughout the fall. The annual set encourages maximum participation by all amateur radio operators, partner organizations, and national, state, and local officials who typically engage in emergency or disaster response. In addition to ARIES volunteers, radio amateurs active in the national traffic system, radio amateur civil emergency services, Skywarn, community emergency response team, and a variety of other allied groups and public service oriented radio amateurs are needed to fulfill important roles in this nationwide exercise. The set allows volunteers to test equipment, modes, and skills under simulated emergency conditions and scenarios. Individuals can use the time to update a go kit for use during deployments and to assure their home station's operational capability in an emergency or disaster. To get involved, contact your local AWRL emergency coordinator or net manager. Check on upcoming planned activities through local, state, and section-wide nets. According to a report from CBS 13 Sacramento, a Myrtle Point, Oregon radio operator was apparently felled by a stroke last month and desperately punched up numbers on his mobile phone thinking he was calling his sister. Those numbers connected him instead with his friend Bill, whom he had met on the air and lives 500 miles away in San Joaquin County, California. Skip had difficulty speaking because his speech was slurred, but suddenly Bill realized who it was who was speaking and that his friend was in distress. Bill's wife, Sharon, a retired nurse, concluded Skip had just had a stroke. The couple dialed 911 and first responders in Oregon were dispatched to his home to transport him to a hospital. According to the news report, Skip is back at home recovering after four days in the hospital and for now he still has some impaired vision. One of the EMTs told Bill and Sharon he would have died within a few hours if he hadn't found help. While Skip recovers, he and Bill, who belongs to the Ham Radio Club in Manteca, have gone back to communicating under less urgent circumstances. They are also using their preferred means of getting in touch with each other. Amateur Radio. Bouvet Island is one of the most sought-after locations on the planet for DX chasing radio hams. It's a very rugged, extinct volcano now covered by a glacier, over 1,000 miles north of Antarctica. All year round, the wind is at gale force. In early August, who would have thought that we would see three proposed Bouvet D expeditions being planned for the next three years? That's in 2021, 22 and 23. However, this all changed by August the 12th, with one team cancelling their plans altogether for 2023.
For the DX community, it's still great news to have two planned the expeditions to Bouvet Island. It's the DXCC's second most wanted entity. The DX Century Club is Amateur Radio's premier award that hams can earn for confirming on-the-air contacts with 100 countries. You can begin with the basic DXCC award and work your way up to the DXCC honour roll. In 2021, the Rebel DX Group is still reporting that they will be active this year from Bouvet Island, which is Islands on the Air reference Alpha November 002. They'll use the call sign 3 Yankee 0 India. The group's leader, Dom 3Z9DX, states that the team will make their second attempt to activate Bouvet Island sometime later this year. The group's first attempt failed in March 2019 due to irreparable damage to the ship's communication equipment. Currently, details about their planned operation is very quiet and not publicised. Their web pages, Facebook pages and Twitter page are still active, although some haven't been updated all that recently. In 2022, the three Yankee Zero Juliet group announced on August the 8th that Kenneth LA7GIA, Runa LA7THA and Irvin LB1QI have found a vessel with a proven track record and experienced polar crew that will take them to Bouvet in November. The vessel is the Marimar. They've assembled a team of 12 operators and plan to spend 20 days around Bouvet. The station location will be Cape Fee at the southeastern part of the island, the only feasible part where a de-expedition can safely set up the camp on rocky ground. They will not set up camp on the glacier. The current list of operators includes two physicians who are also radio hands and includes Norwegian, Russian and American operators. Activity will be on 160 to 10 metres, including 60, 30, 17 and 12 metres, using CW, single sideband, RIT and FT8 and FT4. Frequencies are posted on their web page. QSL is via M0 Oscar X-Ray Oscar, Direct, OQRS or Logbook of the World. The team cautions do not request via the normal Bureau card services, as these will not be answered. Use only the OQRS online service. The option for free Bureau cards will be activated at the end, when all other cards have been sent out. The team is looking for funding. Sponsors who donate 50 US dollars or more prior to the de-expedition start will have their QSL card sent directly, as well as Logbook of the World confirmation. There's no need to do anything if you're a sponsor of the de-expedition. The timing of the QSL cards and LOTW will be processed according to sponsor level. For more details and updates, keep an eye on www.3y0j.no. Inov Antenna and WIMO have renewed their sponsorship for 3Y0J and will supply all the Yagis. The de-expedition will have several tri-banders on 20, 15 and 10 metres, several dual-banders on 17 and 12 metres and a mono-bander for 20 metres. A unique Yagi specifically designed for Bouvet is being manufactured. It's named the DXR3 Bouvet. For 2023, the Intrepid DX Group announced on August the 3rd that their de-expedition to Bouvet Island was back on and that they had found a suitable and affordable vessel willing to take them to Bouvet. However, this all changed on August the 12th. Paul, November 6, Papa Sierra Echo, sent out a message that they now found themselves as the number three team in line to go to Bouvet. And this recent development was not comfortable for them, so they're now re-examining the top 10 most wanted DXCC entities with a plan to redirect their efforts to an activation that would be most beneficial to everyone. They were closing their plans to visit Bouvet, but planned instead to activate a different, rare and very much needed entity sometime in January, February 2023. This is now their focus, and they recommended watching out for more updates on this new project. The Intrepid DX Group nevertheless wished their former 3Y0J teammates a safe and productive journey to Bouvet. There's a really interesting 51-minute presentation about the 2018 Three Yankee Zero Zulu activation by the Central Arizona DX Association. It goes into great detail about just how much preparation and financial backing is necessary to activate such a remote place. It's presented by Glenn Johnson, Whiskey Zero Golf Juliet, and it's called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Just go to YouTube 
and search for Three Yankee Zero Zulu. The schooner Bowden is a century old this year. Now owned by the Maine Maritime Academy as a training vessel, the ham radio history of the 88-foot length overall Bowden is often neglected. Constructed in Maine specifically for Arctic exploration, the vessel relied on amateur radio for communication during explorer Donald B. McMillan's Arctic Expedition of 1923 and on the McMillan McDonald Bird Expedition of 1925, thanks in part to ARRL co-founder Hiram Percy Maxim, W1AW. The venerable vessel, the official vessel of the state of Maine, and the flagship of Maine Maritime Academy's Vessel Operations and Technology Program recently underwent a complete hull restoration and refitting, and has done a little touring to market centenary. Its home port is Castine, Maine. The long-wave transmitters Macmillan used on his earlier missions had proved unable to penetrate the screen of the Aurora Borealis, ARRL historian Michael Marinaro, WN1M, explained in his article Polar Exploration in the June 2014 issue of QST. In 1923, Macmillan turned to ARRL for help in outfitting his next expedition with better wireless gear. Marinaro recounted, it was enthusiastically provided. Maxim and the ARRL board recruited Donald H. Mix, 1TS, of Bristol, Connecticut, to accompany the crew as its radio operator. M.B. West, an ARRL board member, designed the gear, which was then built by amateurs at his firm, Zenith Electronics. The transmitter operated on the medium wave bands of 185, 220, and 300 meters, running 100 watts to a pair of Western Electric G tubes. Earlier exploratory missions had used gear that operated on long wave frequencies. The shipboard station on board the Bowdoin was given the call sign WNP, which stood for Wireless North Pole. WNP transmitted weekly 500 word press releases and listings of stations worked and heard, Marinaro said. Once received by amateur stations, these reports were delivered to local affiliated newspapers of the North American Newspaper Alliance. From there, they were distributed syndicate-wide by telegraph. Macmillan's subsequent attempt at the North Pole centered around wireless. The objectives, supported by the Navy and the National Geographic Society, were to determine the full capabilities of radio north of the auroral belt and to explore the northern reaches by air. The outstanding accomplishment of the 1925 expedition was in the sphere of radio. Utilizing shortwaves, the expedition was in consistent contact with the outside world throughout the journey to the delight of amateurs who were able to work them. The phenomenal success proved to the Navy that shortwaves were definitely superior to the long waves and ultra-long waves that fleets had been using. AMSAT DL reports that the antenna used by amateur radio station Delta Papa Zero Gulf Victor November in Antarctica for Q0100 geostationary satellite contacts has been completely destroyed. According to the Alfred Wegener Institute, a severe winter storm hit their location at Atka Bay, Antarctica at the end of last week. At Neumair Station 3, about 20 kilometers away, wind speeds of 175.7 kilometers per hour were recorded over a one-minute average during the night from the 13th to the 14th of August. The strongest gust was 207 kilometers per hour. This is by far the highest wind speed measured in recent years. Unfortunately, the antenna for the geostationary Q0100 amateur radio satellite was completely destroyed during the storm, despite the weatherproof radome. This means that no school's contacts with DP0GVN can take place until further notice. AMSAT DL and the Alfred Wegener Institute hope to erect a new antenna early next year, in particular to continue the very successful contacts with schools. You can read more at amsat-dl.org. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Happy birthday to the IBM PC. It turned 40 on Thursday. The original IBM personal computer came out August 12th, 1981. A Skunk Works project from the big computer company. Personal computers up to that point were really uh, small companies, little startups trying to make personal computers. Things like the, uh, the Mitz Altair, which was out of a little company in Albuquerque, New Mexico called Mitz that was making it. it was, I think it was a kit originally and then they, then they, I think you could buy it assembled at some of the early computer stores like the Byte Shop and then, uh, you know, Apple came along with the Apple One and then the Apple II in the late 70s 
In fact, Apple very famously took out a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal when IBM announced its PC, saying, Welcome, IBM. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I think they were serious, even though Steve Jobs is no fan of Big Blue, as IBM was known, because they were, uh, you know, the stuffy, you know, guys with little black ties and short sleeve white shirts with pocket protectors and little black glasses. They were the, you know, the, the business nerds. And they, you know, Steve was creating a hippie computer company with Apple. The technical name for the IBM PC. It was developed uh, as a Skunk Works project out of Boca Raton, Florida. Wait, yeah, that was like away from the headquarters, the IBM headquarters in Armok, New York. They were uh, they were off doing their own thing, and they did some interesting, uh, made some interesting choices. They did basically it was off the shelf hardware, kind of pretty stock, nothing special. They decided that they needed an operating system. Microsoft convinced them that they should be the ones to create the operating system. It's kind of a famous story of IBM coming out to a little Monterey company, digital research that had been making something called DR-DOS for uh, Apple computers and said, you know, we would like, we'd like you to make our uh, operating system for IBM PC. And Gary Kildall, the founder of uh, DR-DOS, was actually flying around. He like was an avid amateur pilot flying around. He could, did, couldn't be bothered to meet with the IBM guys. So they said, oh, well, never mind. And they went up to uh, Redmond, Washington, a little company called Microsoft, which had done some stuff like BASIC for the original MITS out there. And they said, would you like to do it? Bill Gates, canny as ever, actually, this might have been his first really canny deal, said, oh, yeah, we've got something for you. Then sneakily went out and, 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 and acquired a disk operating system for the chip that IBM was using, the 8088, from another company. Uh, Seattle DOS, they never told them that what they were buying was uh, going to be the operating system for what would be, as everybody expected, the biggest computer in history. Because once IBM put its might and muscle behind a personal computer, well, that means they're here, you know. Once the big iron company, the mainframe company said, yeah, personal computers, whoa, that was it. So Bill got it for a song, turned around, maybe, I don't know, they might have modified it slightly and sold it to IBM, but he did something else very smart. He said, I'll make you PC DOS, but I want to keep the rights to it. I'm not going to give it to you. I want the royalties. And IBM, not thinking this was going to be a big deal, said, ah, oh, yeah, sure, whatever, whatever you want. Whatever you want. Can't be, you know, how, how many... Computer, look at Commodore 64. How many computers have they sold? It's not going to be. So they, they, they made the deal. Off-the-shelf hardware and software and essentially an open architecture. The only thing that was unique to the IBM PC was its basic input-output system, the firmware that the computer loaded on boot. That was the compatibility later. If you could duplicate that, everything else you could buy, including, because of Bill Gates' canny deal, PC-DOS, which they called MS-DOS, if you bought it. Original IBM PC, the 5150, that was the name. Nobody remembers that. The, <laughs> they just remember the IBM PC. Started at $1,565. That did not include a floppy disk. Those were actually pretty rare in the time. That included a cassette adapter. So you could hook up a cassette to it. <laughs> if you wanted to load it up, more like 3000 And that was when a dollar was really a dollar back in 1981. You could have high-resolution monochrome text if you wanted. Or if you, if you were a Commodore type and you wanted color, you could get low-resolution graphics. Or you could have both. How much RAM? How much RAM do you think? It was an Intel 8088 CPU running at, I remember this, 4.77 megahertz. Mega, not giga. So that should give you some idea of RAM. Not gigabytes. Not even megabytes. <laughs> We're talking kilobytes. The original IBM PC for $1,565 had 16 kilobytes of RAM. You could spend more and get 64 kilobytes. Ooh. And you could, if you had lots of money, buy a floppy disk. No hard, hard drive? What's that? Hard drives are really expensive. I remember buying a 5 megabyte with an M hard drive in that era. For $5,000. My boss got bought it, not me. 
IBM also put their uh, might behind something called the ISA bus, which uh, allowed you to plug in cards. Didn't take very long before somebody figured out how to reverse engineer the BIOS and the IBM compatibles were born. I think it was less than a year. And, uh, of course, that whole industry took off. IBM discontinued the original PC in three years, no, six years later, 1987. 1987. And uh, remember the PC Junior they followed it up with? It was a terrible, terrible flop. Happy birthday, 40th birthday for the computer that, you know, I know Apple did a lot and Commodore and other companies, you know, Atari. But it was really the IBM PC that made the personal computer revolution take off. And the fact that IBM said, yeah, we don't have to own this. We can be, a, we can make it an open architecture. That was really... That was really quite an interesting choice. Made a lot of money for Microsoft, too, by the way. The IBM PC. Happy birthday. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Monday, April 15th, 1912, 12.30 a.m. We are over the North Atlantic at 41 degrees 46 minutes north and 50 degrees 14 minutes west. Down below is a majestic ship, the largest and most luxurious ship in the world on its maiden voyage. In the wireless room is a 5-kilowatt Marconi station and before it sit two tired operators who make $20 per month, not as employees of the shipping line, but rather as employees of the Marconi Company. The in-basket is still full of messages, everything from personal telegrams to stock market quotations. They are so busy working Cape Race, Newfoundland, that they didn't even notice the slight grinding jar 30 minutes earlier. As the two wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, pass the routine traffic, the captain came in, said the ship had struck an iceberg, and told them to send a distress call at once. The blue spark jumped across the gap as Phillips sent CQD, come quick danger. Send SOS, Bride said. It is the new call, and it may be your last chance to send it. Thus began the moment in history that changed radio. Two hours later, Jack Phillips and over 1,500 others were dead. The Titanic lay at the bottom of the ocean, and 713 survivors huddled in half-filled lifeboats waiting to be rescued. The tragic errors in the story of the Titanic pointed out the need of wireless regulation. The first ship to answer the distress call was the German liner, the Frankfurt. While the Frankfurt wireless operator was informing his captain, the Carpathia and Cape Race chimed in. When the Frankfurt operator came back to get more information, Phillips tapped back, Shut up, shut up, you fool. Stand by and keep out. While this would seem bizarre by our standards, it made perfect sense to the operators of 1912. The Titanic, Carpathia, and Cape Race were filled with Marconi operators and stations, while the Frankfurt utilized the services of Marconi's German competitor, Telefunken. This commercial war was extended down to the individual operators. No routine traffic would ever pass, from a Marconi station to arrival, and even in an emergency, if Marconi stations were available, the others would be shut out. The wireless controversy would continue after the Carpathia picked up the survivors. A wireless message was received, allegedly from the Carpathia, which said, All passengers of liner Titanic safely transferred to this ship and SS Parisian. CCOM. Titanic being towed by Allen Liner Virginian to port. Other wireless messages appeared, also stating that all passengers were safe and the ship was being towed in. There was just one problem. These messages were not coming from the Carpathia. For one thing, her wireless had a maximum range of 150 miles. For another, the Carpathia wireless operator had made only a few transmissions to the Olympic, the sister ship of the Titanic and another Marconi operation, in which he had tapped out the list of survivors, some coded messages from Bruce Ismay, president of the White Star Line, 
then shut down his station. So complete was the radio silence from the Carpathia that they refused to answer the call from the Navy cruisers sent to the scene by President Taft. The White Star Line, owners of the Titanic, were still insisting that everyone was safe and that the ship had not sunk. But even as they made these claims, they had all the horrific details from the Olympic. And so would the rest of the world, thanks to a 21-year-old operator named David Sarnoff, who managed to detect the faint signals of the Olympic and broke the story. Faced with the truth and hounded by thousands of reporters and outraged relatives of passengers, the White Star Line officials finally broke down and revealed all. Meanwhile, the Carpathia steamed towards New York City. When she passed within range of shore stations, there were frenzied attempts by amateur wireless operators which formed a hissing mixture from which scarcely a complete sentence was intelligible. It didn't matter because the radio silence continued. At the Port of New York, the Carpathia was met by Senator William A. Smith of Michigan, a no-nonsense populist who was the chairman of the committee investigating the shipwreck. He immediately slapped subpoenas on everyone possible, including Harold Bride and Harold Cotman, wireless operator on the Carpathia. Marconi himself, who was in the U.S. at the time and had planned on taking the Titanic back to England, was also summoned to appear. The hearings revealed the information given above, plus the disturbing fact that the Californian was just 10 miles from the Titanic. Not only did the Californian not have a full-time wireless operation, but the ship's captain ignored the eight distress rockets sent up by the Titanic. As to the origin of the false messages concerning the saving of the ship and the passengers, no answer was ever found. However, Senator Smith sarcastically noted that in the interim, the Titanic was quickly reinsured and stock in the Marconi Company jumped from $55 a share to $225 a share. The senator did find out the cause of the Carpathia radio silence. It was Marconi himself. He had sent a wireless message to Bride and Cotman stating, Marconi Company taking good care of you. Keep your mouth shut. Hold your story. You will get big money. Now clear. It turned out that Marconi had an agreement with the New York Times for an exclusive story. Thus, essential information for desperate relatives and official inquiries from the President of the United States took a back seat to Marconi's interest. When Marconi got on the stand, Senator Smith pounced on him with astonishing vehemence. Marconi had been lionized by the nation, and now the senator was treating him like any other entrepreneur who put profit above the public. Senator Smith was warned that his attack on a man as popular as Marconi was political suicide, but he didn't care. In his obsession with his belief that the unregulated wireless spectrum was partially to blame in the Titanic disaster, he painted Marconi as a man willing to subordinate the public good to his goal of a complete wireless equipment and spectrum monopoly. Senator Smith used the Titanic hearings to condemn the laissez-faire status of the wireless and appealed for the international regulation of radio. On May 8, 1912, Senator Smith introduced a bill in the Senate. Among its provisions, 1. Ships carrying 50 passengers or more must have a wireless set with a minimum range of 100 miles. 2. Wireless sets must have an auxiliary power supply which can operate until the wireless room itself was underwater or otherwise destroyed. And 3. Two or more operators provide continuous service day and night. In response to the interference generated over the years, and especially when the Carpathia was within range, a provision was added that private stations could not use wavelengths in excess of 200 meters except by special permission. To avoid ownership of the spectrum by the Marconi Company, licenses would now be required issued by the Secretary of Commerce. Each government, marine, or commercial station would be authorized a specific wavelength, power level, and hours of operation. The initial legislation had considered the elimination of all private, non-commercial, that is, amateur stations, but Congress realized that it would be difficult and expensive to enforce. Therefore, since it was a well-known fact that long wavelengths were the best and anything below 250 meters was useless except for local communication, it was decided to compromise and give the amateurs 200 meters where they could work 25 miles maximum and would die out of their own accord in a few years. How the amateurs cope with 200 meters will be our focus next time. I hope you'll join us.
This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. We have an updated report on the Volunteer Monitor Program this week. The Volunteer Monitor Program, overseen by the FCC and the ARRL, has just put a number of amateurs on notice for questionable on-air behavior. Hams around the country have been sent advisory notices from the Volunteer Monitor Program. A report released by Program Administrator Raleigh Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, gives details on the notices sent to Hams deemed in violation of FCC Part 97. The program's July report released recently gives the results of more than 3,000 hours of observation combined on the HF, VHF, and UHF frequencies. Although these were advisory notices, one notification sent to a ham in Parks, Arizona, was referred to the FCC for enforcement action. In that instance, the ham is being reported for failing to honor a request to stay off a local repeater. Some of the other notices included a general class licensee in Ackworth, Georgia, who received a notice for failing to identify properly and for repeatedly making contact with unlicensed stations on 3.895 MHz. A notice was sent to an extra class ham in Keensburg, New Jersey, involving threats made on the air to another operator while on 3.844 MHz. Notices were also sent to some general class licensees for operating on 20 meters in the extra class portion of the band. Those hams are in Marco Island and Arcadia, Florida, and in Maryland. Technician class licensees also received notices. Those hams were in Spring Valley, Spring River, and Nipomo, California, Oneonta, New York, Idaho Falls, Idaho, and Center, Texas. The notices indicated they were operating FT8 on frequencies not authorized to technician licensees. The Volunteer Monitor Program began operation in 2020. It was established to underscore the need for amateur compliance on the air. Trained volunteer monitors also recognize hams who are observed engaging in commendable conduct. Foundations of Amateur Radio a couple of weeks ago, an amateur put out a call on the local email discussion list. The message was simple. It read, I have a 606A HP signal generator with a copy of the operating and service manual. It covers 50 kilohertz to 65 megahertz, free to a good home. Smiley face. It's not the first time that such a message has done the rounds, but this time my reply was quick enough for it to be first. Overnight, I became the new custodian of a Hewlett Packard 606A signal generator. A signal generator is a tool that can form a specific carrier across a range of frequencies, in much the same way that your amateur radio can. In this case, the HP 606A can cover all the amateur HF bands and everything in between. The signal that's generated is calibrated, that is, it's of a specific power level, very stable, clean, and it can be used to calibrate other equipment. To set the scene, the HP 606A was released into the wild in 1959. You might call it vintage at this point. It's the size of a modern microwave oven, so I'll need to set aside some bench space in order to actually use it. According to some, it's, quote, the best analog signal generator ever built, unquote. It's been in production for decades with plenty of information to be found online. Unlike most modern gear, this equipment comes fully documented by the manufacturer, to the point of user manual revisions depending on the serial number, and including essentials like circuit diagrams, parts list, spare parts list, calibration instructions and the equipment needed, how to open it up, tests to conduct after repair, how to conduct regular maintenance, and how to replace the tubes in it. Yes, I did say tubes, or valves, or glow-in-the-dark electronics. At this point, I've not yet switched it on. You might wonder why that's the case. This unit has internal voltages exceeding 500 volt DC, so some care is required. Inside are at least four electrolytic capacitors. Think of each of them as two pieces of aluminium sandwiched together separated by a piece of foil and electrolytic paste, all rolled up into a cylinder. When an electrolytic capacitor is built, the process to convert these components into an actual capacitor involves forming it, which means that the manufacturer applies a specific voltage to the pins of the capacitor and in doing so causes a chemical reaction, 
which makes all manner of funky stuff happen, including unidirectional conductance, something you're looking for in a capacitor. Over time, when not in use, or in my case in storage, this chemical reaction reverses, and the capacitors are back to rolled up aluminium with some foil in between. Powering it up in this state will let the smoke out. It turns out that in many cases you can apply the voltage again and reform the capacitor. Apparently, according to the author of To Be or Not To Be Modification Manual by H. I. Isensen, applying the voltage for 5 minutes plus 1 minute per month of storage does the trick. In my case, I can leave the capacitors in circuit and apply the voltage externally using a variac, a variable AC transformer, loaned to me by Dennis Victor Kilo 6 Alpha Kilo Romeo. Doing the math is a little tricky, since we don't really know when the unit was last powered up, but we're told it was some time in the last decade, so a couple of hours should suffice. But there are some wrinkles in relation to voltage and managing the step to powering up the tubes, so when I've made it happen, I'll let you know. Dennis was kind enough to help with opening up the cabinet and having a look-see inside. We noticed that it has previously been expertly repaired with a few replaced components, and Dennis managed to identify some likely failed tubes, so we're on the scrounge for those. Together we did some initial tests and ran up the unit using low voltage to determine if the various test points were actually showing the proportional voltages that were expected. This isn't like a digital circuit where it either works or not. Using a variac, you can slowly power this up, to a point, and test along the way. This brings us to the provenance of this tool. I got it from Dave, Victor Kilo 6 Alpha India, and from discussion we think it came from the estate of Don, Victor Kilo 6 Hotel Kilo, now Silent Key. I've met Don's widow, who happens to be the neighbour of a friend, so at some point, when I have it working, I might give her a call. I don't know who owned it before Don. I do know that when it was released in 1959, it was sold for $1,540 US dollars, the equivalent of $14,000 in today's money, or half a car back then. Based on serial numbers, this HP 606A appears to have been manufactured between October 1961 and August 1966, so it's older than I am. In case you have extra information, the serial number is 009, dash 01180 and my email address is cq at vk6flab.com if you have spare valves a 12b4a is high on the list get in touch while dennis and i were exploring inside the guts of this function generator we were at the clubhouse of the local wavhf group surrounded by other amateurs who were doing their own thing at one point i looked up and noticed two amateurs in deep discussion about using a piece of software chirp to program a handheld radio on a windows 10 laptop whilst i was sitting across the table picking through the guts of a 1960s piece of equipment it made me smile thinking about the history that those two extremes represented becoming the custodian for such a significant piece of equipment isn't for everyone i've been given suggestions to toss it out and buy something modern but i have to confess even though i'm software personified sdr to the core well aiming to be, this piece of equipment does something for me. What equipment do you own that makes you go all misty-eyed? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reports that, in addition to the already well-known intruders, some new or rarely heard signals have been spotted, including a burst signal from an over-the-horizon radar system in China. With more details on the ever-growing list of intruders on the amateur bands, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The IARUMS July newsletter reported that this signal in 3.8 second bursts was encountered repeatedly on different 40 and 20 meter frequencies. NATO military systems were more active in various amateur bands as well, using an alphabet soup of modes such as MIL-188, 110A, LINK-11, CLU and SLU and STANAG-4285 and 4481FSK and MIL-188-14A ALE. Here's a STANAG-4285 signal, by the way.
You want to hope something like that doesn't open up next to your frequency. FSK, ARQ, and PSK ARQ emissions with typical 600 baud, 600 hertz, or even 1200 hertz have been conspicuous for some time, attributed to North Korea. Of course, over-the-horizon radars predominate, and some broadcasters interfere regularly, too, often on 40 meters. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. For many days, a Link 11 clue station was active on 7159.0 kHz in double sideband mode, 6 kHz wide, at times causing heavy interference. Predominant over-the-horizon radars monitored included the Russian container as well as the British Pluto system from Cyprus, generating annoying interference. On 14301.9 kHz, an orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM60, signal could be found occasionally. Some broadcasters interfere regularly. Radio France Internationale on 7205 kHz splatters down to 7186 kHz from 2100 to 2200 UTC. The voice of broad masses is regularly found on 7140 and 7180 kHz. China Radio International, CRI, is often found on 1400 kHz, and Sound of Hope from Taiwan is sometimes audible if conditions permit, but the signal is often jammed. Radio station WBZ in Boston is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2021. This is the oldest broadcast station in New England and one of the oldest stations in the United States. New England's oldest broadcast station is marking its 100th anniversary this year and two amateur radio clubs in Massachusetts are inviting everyone to the party on the amateur radio band. The Malarica Amateur Radio Society along with the Hampton County Radio Association in Springfield will be commemorating this anniversary by conducting a special operating event starting at 1300 UTC or 9 o'clock in the morning, a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, September 17th, and ending at 0359 UTC, September 20th. WBZ began operations on September 15th of 1921, the Westinghouse Works Building on Page Boulevard in East Springfield, Massachusetts, broadcasting with just 100 watts. In 1931, Westinghouse moved the station to Boston, and its 15,000-watt transmitter was moved to Willis, by 1933, Westinghouse increased WBZ's power to 50,000 watts. And in 1940, the transmitter was moved to Hull. The station was made famous with its slogan, The Spirit of New England. After World War I, wireless radio grew with an increase in ham radio operators, and amateurs greatly contributed to the advance of the radio arts. One of their contributions was the development of voice-modulated radio signals, which used amplitude modulation. WBZ's first broadcast using amplitude modulation was 100 years ago. For their efforts, amateurs were granted permanent privileges for frequencies in the 80, 40, 20, and 10 meter shortwave bands by the International Treaty of 1927. The partnership of commercial broadcasting and amateur radio hobbyists is very beneficial to all. Amateurs using the call signs W1W, W1B, W1Z, and WB1Z will make two-way contact with other amateurs across all bands on sideband, AM, CW, and digital modes. A special QSL card will be sent to anyone who contacts one or more of the special event stations and sends a card accompanied by a self-addressed stamped envelope. The card will feature historical photos of WBZ over the years, as well as a special 100th anniversary WBZ logo. A historical sheet will also be available for the download. The Alexander Grimton Friendship Association reports that, what it calls, an incredible number of listener reports, 524 in all, for July 4th Anderson Day transmissions from SAQ, the Ant Alexanderson Alternator Very Low Frequency Station in Sweden. SAQ transmits on 17.2 kilohertz. We are overwhelmed by all the fantastic feedback we have received from all of you around the world in listeners' reports and on our YouTube channel, the Association said, The weather on Alexanderson Day was sunny, with temperatures around 25 degrees Celsius. Some approaching thunderstorms could be seen on the horizon, the report said. For the first time since the pandemic started, we were able to have a limited seated audience in the transmitter hall. 
and that was fantastic. The Alexander Grimton Friendship Association managed to carry out two successful transmissions to the world from the old Alexanderson alternator SAQ. The first transmission was initiated at 0830 UTC with the startup and tuning of the Alexanderson alternator. The message was sent out a half an hour later and the transmission event was live streamed via YouTube. A second transmission was made at 1200 UTC. Special event amateur station SK6SAQ, which operates from the SAQ site, was on the air for Alexanderson Day. On Alexanderson Day, HF conditions were not optimal, but the radio amateurs reached 169 QSOs with 21 countries, mostly in Europe and a few in the U.S. The report continued. Two stations were in operation, both single sideband and CW. The Alexanderson alternator is an electromechanical radio transmitter that dates to the 1920s. Jay Rusgrove, W1VD in Burlington, Connecticut, was among the U.S. listeners who submitted a report. The first transmission was a washout due to high QRN he recounted. The second transmission had somewhat lower QRN levels. Reception was not as good as some year's summer transmissions, which turned out to be unexpectedly good. Rusgro posted a brief audio file from the second transmission tune-up and the message transmission. Listen closely for the clean CW signal beneath the noise. Despite the global effects of the COVID pandemic, the 24th International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend is going ahead over the weekend of the 21st and 22nd of August with strong support from the amateur radio fraternity from 42 countries. The organisers, Kevin, Victor Kilo 2, Charlie Echo, and Ted, Whiskey 8, Tango Tango Sierra, say that 310 registrations have been received to the 16th of August, with Germany in the lead with 63 entries, followed by the USA with 45, Australia with 38, and the UK with 25. Some of the smaller countries that only have one entry are the Azores, Cuba, Cyprus, Gibraltar, Iceland, Market Reef and Slovenia. Operators are of course reminded that local COVID restrictions must be adhered to over the weekend, so some cancellations are expected as health and safety rules may change at the last minute. The organisers wish all entrants a safe and enjoyable weekend. You can still register at the website illw.net. The Irish Radio Transmitter Society report that the third full weekend of August has become the regular date for the International Weekend for Lighthouses. Countries all over the world have become involved in lighthouse activations on HF. A few years ago, the United States Congress declared the 7th of August as their National Lighthouse Day, and during the event, amateur radio operators in America set up portable stations at lighthouses and contacted each other. Their objective was to encourage lighthouse managers, the keepers and owners, to open the lighthouse or light station and associated visitor centres to the public, thus raising the profile of lighthouses, light vessels and other navigational aids, and preserving their maritime time heritage. This event is known as the U.S. National Lighthouse Week. In Britain, the Association of Lighthouse Keepers, the ALK, conducts their International Lighthouse Heritage Weekend on the same August weekend as the Amateur Radio International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend. It came into being in 1998 as the Scottish Northern Lights Award, run by the Air Amateur Radio Group. The ILLW usually takes place on the third weekend in August each year and attracts over 500 lighthouse entries located in over 40 countries. It's one of the most popular international amateur radio events in existence, probably because there are very few rules and it's not the usual contest type event. It's also free and there are no prizes for contacting large numbers of other stations. There's little doubt that the month of August has become Lighthouse Month, due largely to the popularity and growth of the ILLW. In Ireland, the Southeastern Amateur Radio Group, using callsign Echo India 2 Whiskey Romeo Charlie, will activate Hook Lighthouse, that's ILLW reference number IE0003, on Saturday and Sunday, the 21st and 22nd of August. Hook Lighthouse is located on the southeast coast of Ireland in County Wexford. 
The present structure is about 800 years old and is the oldest intact operational lighthouse in the world. Hook Lighthouse offers guided tours of the lighthouse tower all year round and it's one of the top things to do in Wexford and Waterford. For more information, you should go to www.hookheritage.ie. The Hook Lighthouse will go on the air, providing that the government guidelines and restrictions at that time allow the activation to run. Full social distancing and all other recommended procedures will be in place for the event. The team say that they look forward to speaking with everyone on the 21st and 22nd of August 2021. And for anyone wishing to find out more about the Southeastern Amateur Radio Group and their activities, you can drop them an email, southeasternarg at gmail.com, and please feel free to go along to any of their meetings. You can check their website at www.searg.ie, and you can also join them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Here is a look at the current propagation forecast as prepared by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle. He reports that weak solar activity persists, but Friday, August 13th was the sole spotless day in the current August 12th to 18th reporting week. Last week, we reported four days with no sunspots in the previous seven days. Average daily sunspot numbers increased from 9.9 .9 last week to 17.7 .7 during this week. Solar flux was the same, with the average inching from 73.7 to 73.8. Geomagnetic indicators were also stable. The average planetary A indice was 6.1 compared to 6.3 last week. Average middle latitude A indices moved from 7.6 to 7. Looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 73 on August 22nd and 23rd, 72 on August 24th through the 26th, 73 on August 27th through the 29th, 74 on August 30th through September 1st, and 73 on September 2nd through the 11th. Looking at the planetary A index now, it will be 8, 10, 14, 12, and 8 on August 22nd to the 26th, 5 on August 27th to September 1st, 8 and 12 on September 2nd and 3rd, 5 on September 4th through the 10th, and 8 on September 11th through the 13th. On August 14th, spaceweather.com reported that there were no sunspots, and that so far in 2021, there have been 56 days with no spots. That might sound like a lot, but it is in fact a sharp reduction from hundreds of spotless days observed in 2019 and 2020, spaceweather.com observed. Despite today's blank sun, solar activity is intensifying compared to previous years. Time now for the AMSAT report. Bruce Page, KK5DO, offers a few of his tricks for working the SO50 satellite. A small handheld beam will work to hear the satellite on 70 centimeters. And he says you can use a typical mobile 2 meter antenna to transmit. But as the satellite gets higher in the sky, it will become invisible to a vehicle mounted antenna. Bruce has his on the trunk though, and when the satellite gets close to 45 degrees, he just hits the trunk release, which changes the antenna's elevation. Reverse the process for the other half of the pass. Bruce also writes down call signs and grids he can copy when he first hears SO50. This way he's ready when someone comes back. They'll probably be on his list, so he's not frantically trying to write down call signs while trying to make adjustments. Just check off the stations you work. He says a recorder, like the one on a smartphone, also is helpful. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Now an update to a story we brought to you a few weeks ago. The tea totaling is done, and a special event from the world's largest teapot in Chester, West Virginia, just wrapped up operations. The world's largest teapot has a long history as a public attraction dating back to the early 1900s. Now thanks to amateur radio, it can claim one more distinction a one-week special event activation that had 9,013 CUSOs contacting all states in the U.S. as well as 68 countries. There was even a decoded slow-scan TV signal from the International Space Station on Saturday, August 7th, during the community's Teapot Festival. This was the first year this formerly local radio event was a coast-to-coast -coast activation, and operators reported massive pileups. Organizer Justin Shaw, W8LPN, of the Hancock Auxiliary Communications team, said there were plans in the works next year to include a bonus station from the United Kingdom. 
Meanwhile, the teapot itself, situated near West Virginia's border with Ohio and Pennsylvania, continues to be steeped in fame and glory. A number of radio operators who are not from the West Virginia area said during their CUSOs that they now have plans to visit this unusual and obviously very inspirational teapot. A big weekend celebrating Canada's Ontario Regiment will be getting underway next month and this year's event is adding amateur radio. The Ontario Regiment Museum, home to the largest collection of working military vehicles in North America, is about to mark an amateur radio first. The North Shore Amateur Radio Club, VE3OSH, will be operating during the museum's Aquino Tank Weekend taking place on September 17th to the 19th. Club President Laird Solomon, VE3LKS, said that the idea to add ham radio to the museum's annual weekend evolved from a dialogue between the museum and one of the club's members who works there as a volunteer. They loved his suggestion that radio become a part of the activities which commemorate the key role the Ontario Regiment played in 1944 during the Battle of Aquino in Italy. Laird said the museum will be placing one of its WW2 communications trucks at the activator's location and hams will be operating CW from there. Operators will also be on the air at three other stations using SSB, FT8, and Yezu Fusion, All-Star and DMR. Laird went on to say that they hope to be able to display the evolution of radio from WW2 to today. Oshawa, the city where the museum is located, has strong ties to the Second World War. Laird said that not far from there, a secret spy training and high-power radio facility called Camp X was set up on the shores of Lake Ontario. It was at that location where Hydra, a powerful radio station, would exchange coded message with Allied headquarters in the U.S. and Britain. So many years later, the North Shore amateurs still have ties to this site too. Laird said that the club was formed by some of the wartime operators who had been assigned to the Hydra station. Roland Anders, K3RA, has announced the starting date for this year's free technician licensing class. Sessions will be held online via Zoom. Classes start on Thursday, September 9th, and will run for seven sessions. Anders has been holding these popular classes from the National Electronics Museum for many years. He chairs the National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee. Anders has been following up his technician like exam classes with classes for prospective general class and amateur extra class licensees. Classes, which are available worldwide, have been recorded for later viewing. For more information, you can contact Anders via email, which is good on his QRZ page. Three schools in Mauritius make contact with that country's first CubeSat. The first satellite launched by Mauritius has been busy doing its part to further students' education. Although the first CubeSat was launched by the nation of Mauritius, is still not available for amateur use, it has already accomplished an important educational mission in STEM education. According to the Mauritius Amateur Radio Society, students at three schools in Mauritius have received and decoded signals from the satellite known as MERSAT-1, which stands for Mauritius Imagery and Radio Telecommunications Satellite 1. AMSAT reported the news from the Ham Radio Society saying that other schools and educational institutions are preparing to follow suit. According to AMSAT, the satellite is still in safe mode and being tested. The Radio Society expects to announce when HAMS will be able to use it. The satellite was deployed from the International Space Station on June 22. MERSAT-1 has an expected lifetime of between two and three years and during that time was expected to make ground contact with Mauritius four or five times daily. HAMS in Romania have proposed some changes that could have an impact on radio license portability throughout Europe. The European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administration Working Group for Frequency Management are studying whether member states throughout Europe should accept presentation of amateur radio licenses in a digitally signed electronic PDF format. The group has given permission for a feasibility study based upon the positive responses to a questionnaire submitted to the CEPT Working Group last year from officials in Romania. Romania is hoping to make its own radio license documents available as PDFs. 
Using the digital document format would allow HAMS the capability to travel Europe without needing paper copies of their licenses. Using mobile devices to display the documents would allow officials checking in CEPT countries by reference to a central CEPT database. A popular subject on ham radio today is Solar Cycle 25. When will it peak? How will it compare to the rather lackluster cycle we've just been through, etc.? But we need to put the horse before the cart, <coughs> i.e., what special or not special factors determine whether 20 meters will stay open tonight or 10 meters tomorrow. One ham who has studied the day-to-day -day conditions of the HF bands is Carl Lutzelschwab, K9LA, the newly appointed ARRL Central Division Director. His interest in RF propagation goes back to his novice days in 1961. Rains Hapali, KC9RP, recently spoke with Carl about the role the ionosphere plays in HF communication daily. The following is our first of two excerpts from their conversation. How many layers are there in the ionosphere and what are the differences? There are three basic layers or regions of the ionosphere. The lowest is the D region. It's ionized by very short wavelength, high energy radiation from the sun. And basically what it is is a detriment because that's where ionospheric absorption occurs. Absorption is just a reduction in signal strength, and it happens on all bands, although it's inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So the lower in frequency you go, the more absorption there is, and that explains why 10 meters can have S9 plus signals, whereas 160 meters... A lot of times the signals are at the noise level. It all has to do with absorption in the D region. The next region up is the E region. That was the first one that was discovered way back when. And it was named E region because of the word electric. And that's what they thought it was an electrical conductor. And I guess you can look at it like that. The E region is pretty much just a daytime region. It pretty much disappears at night. And its major attribute is probably blocks signals from getting up to the F2 region, which offers the longest hops. So the E region is not as bad as the D region, but it can be good and bad. The third region is the F2 region. It's the highest in the atmosphere, and it's responsible for probably 99% of our long-distance QSOs. It's very dynamic. It varies diurnally, you know, over the day, by month, by season, and of course, where we are in a solar cycle. That's a quick picture of the three regions. You notice I call them regions, not layers. A layer kind of leads you to believe that there's something there, but there's nothing in between. But in reality, the ionosphere is a continuous electron density as you go up in altitude. And it just happens that the F2 region and the E2 region are peaks. And there is stuff in between. So I've gotten used to calling them regions, not layers. But layers is okay. To find F1 and F2. We can tell the difference by the height in the atmosphere. The E region's you know, around 90 to 120 kilometers up there. F region is above the E region. So height is one way, and also electron density. When solar radiation at various wavelengths impinges on the atmosphere, it creates free electrons. In other words, it knocks an electron off an atom or a molecule, and the electrons are what enable our propagation. We measure the D region with rocket flights and incoherent scatter radar. Ionosons aren't sensitive enough to measure the D region. We measure the E and F regions with ionosons. If the frequency is high enough, it will go through the E region because the E region does not have as many electrons usually as the F region. And we can pin down the number of electrons in the E region and in the F region. And we can actually see an F1 and an F2 region during the day. But during the night, it kind of goes into a combination of just one F region. So we can measure 
what's going on, and we can see how the electron density varies with height in the various regions and also uh, the actual height of the, the electron densities. Is electron density entirely controlled or affected by the sun? That's a good question, Hap. Certainly, a solar radiation instigates the ionization process, you know, knocking a free electron off an atom or a molecule. But there are two other factors that can determine what the ionization or the electron density is at any given time. One is geomagnetic field activity that's tied to what you're probably familiar with, the K index and the A index. The K index is a three-hour index, so there are eight of those during the day, and the A index is an average of the eight three-hour K indices. So the K index is a more short-term parameter, whereas the A index is a daily parameter. It tries to give us a picture of how active the Earth's magnetic field is. The higher the K index, the higher the A index, the more active the Earth's magnetic field, and that can cause the ionosphere to get screwed up. Elevated K indices can modify the the electron density. The second parameter we're beginning to realize and find out is that events in the lower atmosphere can couple up to the ionosphere. For example, we can see the signature of a tsunami in the ionosphere. We can see the signature of an earthquake in the ionosphere, and we can see the signature of even underground nuclear explosions in the ionosphere. These may be very small, but we can see them, and they can modify the ionosphere so that uh, things are either better or worse than what the solar radiation alone is doing. It's a very dynamic system up there, and our understanding of the ionosphere is on a statistical basis. We can't predict what's going to happen today. We can predict what the average ionosphere looks like over a month and then tie probabilities to what the days may look like. One of these days, we may have enough understanding that we'll have daily propagation predictions. It's kind of like the weather, a lot of probabilities in there. Let me clear up one thing about the K and A indices, although they're reported every hour on WWV, remember the K index is a three-hour index, so it doesn't change over a three-hour period. It may get reported every hour, but it's the same one for three hours. When the next three-hour period occurs, that's when the K index is updated. And the K index is reported for 00 to 03 UTC, 03 to U6 UTC, et cetera, all through the day. Why haven't we been able to determine that? No one ever really took an interest in it, but it's becoming clear with the warming, the atmosphere, and stuff like that. It's leading us into lots of research and, of course, our ability to predict what propagation may not be that important for amateur radio, but for over-the-horizon radars in terms of defense, that's very important. The A and K indices you refer to are given every hour and 18 minutes after the hour on WWV on 2.5510. 15, 20, and 25 megahertz. I actually occasionally am hearing the 25 megahertz signal. With respect to 25 megahertz, I think it's been kind of off and on the air. I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing cycle 25 starting its increase. We've been at solar minimum for a number of years, and that means the higher frequencies won't propagate too well. But as cycle 25 rises, we get more sunspots, we get more solar flux, and what's most important, we get more extreme ultraviolet because that's what the true ionization source in the F2 region, which is responsible for our long-distance QSOs. So what we're seeing now is better propagation on the higher bands. It'll take probably about four years for cycle 25 to rise. So it's going to be kind of a slow rise, but we'll see improvement in the higher bands, 15, 12, and 10 meters, as cycle 25 ascends. 
Every year, there's what is referred to as a sporadic E season. What makes that sporadic this time of year more than others? We know that the electrons that make up the sporadic E layer, it's more appropriate to call it a layer because it is a very thin layer of electrons, only a couple kilometers thick. It's not like the other regions of the ionosphere. It's kind of unique in that way. But we know that the source of that is meteor deposition. There are many, many, many meteors that ablate through our atmosphere on a daily basis. And our understanding of how all those electrons are compressed into a very thin layer is not fully understood yet. But we believe wind shear does it. Also, the Earth's magnetic field has a role in it. It does occur every year. I've seen papers that show that the deposition of meteors peaks in the summer, and that sure suggests that that's where the summer peak of sporadic E comes from. Sporadic E doesn't appear to be dependent on a solar cycle very much. So sporadic E season in the summer will occur regardless of where we are in a solar cycle. There's also a minor sporadic E peak in December. So we should also keep a lookout in December, but it's nothing like what happens in May through July and even into August. Why December? That one's not real clear to me, and I'm not sure it's real clear to everybody else. There's probably atmospheric issues that are happening that we don't fully understand yet. So I don't have an answer for that. Is the sun furthest away in December than it is in June, or is it the angle that is more direct one of those months versus the other? It's the angle. The Earth, its rotational axis is not up and down with the ecliptic, which is the plane in which the Earth goes around the sun. Winter, we are closer to the sun, but the northern hemisphere is kind of tilted away. So that doesn't help. In the summertime, we're farther from the sun, but of course, the northern hemisphere is tilted more towards the sun. And that means there's more solar radiation in the summertime. It's more of a zenith thing as opposed to grazing angles. That's what also determines the seasons, temperatures, and all that stuff. And it has an impact on the ionosphere, too. Let me also say that during the summer months, sporadic E is best in your late morning local time and also your early to late evening local time. This summer has sure seemed to be extremely good. I'm sure that has to do with whatever drives the making of a sporadic E layer. But we also got to remember the human factors. Most every radio nowadays has six meters. And also the digital modes have just opened up six meters and even the higher bands, 15, 12, and 10, regardless of the fact that we're just coming out of solar minimum. There are references to gray line propagation on the HF ham bands. Gray line refers to when the path that you're looking at, for example, Indiana to South America, is aligned with the terminator, which is the dividing line between day and night on Earth. We have to remember that the terminator goes around the whole Earth. Like I said, it divides day and night. On the day side, of course, the ionosphere is just starting to form. And on the night side, the D region has pretty much gone away and the absorption is lowest. So there's usually better propagation along the gray line. Like I said, that's when the path is aligned with the terminator. You should always look around your sunrise and your sunset. If it corresponds to sunrise and sunset on the other end of the path you're looking at, it's not something that happens all the time, but if you're in the right place at the right time, it can give you some great enhancements in propagation, especially on the lower bands. And where does long path fall into all this? When you look at a globe, there are two ways to get to a distant point. One is a great circle route, which is the shortest distance between any two points on a globe. One is short path, and then the other way around is long path. 
as the names apply, short path is usually much shorter than the long path because it's shorter. That generally says short path is going to be the better of the two. But we have to remember that what decides whether long path or short path occurs is the maximum usable frequency, the MUF or the amount of ionization in the ionosphere enough to refract your signal back to Earth? And is the absorption low enough for your signal to be detected? That can vary during the day. There are great examples of long path. One of the best ones I have is working Japan in the morning via long path here from Indiana. Hopefully we'll see that as cycle 25 rises and there's more ionization for 28 megahertz. So it can be refracted. That's a path from Indiana to the southeast and it comes into Japan from the southwest. It occurs quite often. There are a number of known long paths that even happen uh, during solar minimum periods like we're in. It's just another mode of propagation that we can take advantage of as amateur radio operators. And that's the first of two excerpts from Hap Holly KC9RP's Zoom conversation with HF propagation expert Carl Lutzelschwab, K9LA newly appointed ARRL Central Division Director. An exhibition has opened showing 100 years of Finnish amateur radio construction, which presents equipment built by radio amateurs themselves. The exhibition is open at the Museum of Technology in Helsinki until August the 29th. This summer, the Finnish Museum of Technology has admired quite a few wonders of design and home construction. This exhibition is called It Started With a Spark, 100 Years of Finnish Radio Amateur Construction. The exhibition has, as its name suggests, brought to the public the equipment built by amateur radio enthusiasts. Co-designed with SRAL, the Finnish Radio Amateur Association, it's part of the association's 100th anniversary programme. At the Finnish Museum of Technology, they're particularly excited about the exhibition because experimenting with new forms of cooperation is rewarding. In this multi-year exhibition project, the curators would not have been able to make it happen without the experts in the subject. That's SRAL's radio amateurs. As a national special museum in the field of technology, it's possible for them to provide a good setting for the exhibition and attract a wide audience that might not otherwise find its way to the topic. Two key people are interviewed on the museum's website. Heike Lempola, a member of SRAL's 100th Anniversary Committee, he's also known in radio amateur circles by callsign Oscar Hotel 2 Bravo Golf X-Ray, and Rina Linna, exhibition producer at the Museum of Technology. So, if you happen to be in Helsinki, you can visit the exhibition and see devices with a frequency range from an audio headset up to microwaves. Transceivers, transmitters, measuring devices and compact antennas are all on display. For more information, take a look at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Finland. NASA is calling all 6th through 12th grade educators and students to submit experiments for possible suborbital flights as a way of gaining first-hand experience with the design and testing process used by NASA researchers. The NASA TechRise Student Challenge invites students to design, build, and launch experiments on suborbital rockets and high-altitude balloons. The challenge aims to inspire a deeper understanding of Earth's atmosphere, space exploration, coding, electronics, and the value of test data. Central to NASA's mission is inspiring and educating the workforce of the future. The research areas students can explore through TechRise are endless, from technology to better understanding our planet to innovative systems for deep space exploration, said NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. We hope to see entries from students across the country showcasing the diverse talent and ideas of the next generation. Guided by an educator, student teams affiliated with U.S. public, private, and charter schools can develop and submit creative experiment ideas. The entry period is open until November 3, 2021. Each winning team will receive $1,500 to build their experiment and an assigned spot to test it on a NASA-sponsored suborbital flight operated by Blue Origin, UP Aerospace, or Raven Aerostar. Flying experiments on suborbital rockets and high-altitude balloons 
takes technologies from ground-based laboratories into relevant testing environments. The flights replicate microgravity, solar exposure, radiation, extreme temperatures, vacuum, and intense vibrations. Understanding how payloads respond to these conditions allow researchers to validate their designs and adjust or make improvements as needed. To enter the competition, teams should submit their experiment ideas online using the TechRise proposal framework. NASA plans to announce the competition winners in January 2022. The selected student teams will build their experiments and watch them take flight in early 2023. NASA and future engineers, the Challenge Administrator, will host a TechRise virtual field trip Friday, September 24th to share more information about the challenge and inspire research questions and experiment ideas. Educators and students can tune in to hear from NASA experts and special guest Dr. Raven Baxter, also known as Dr. Raven the Science Maven, and explore on-demand educational content at their own pace. Interested participants can register online. In addition, various resources on the Challenge website aim to help students choose a vehicle and plan experiments on topics ranging from climate to remote sensing to microgravity research. It's an honor to be part of the virtual field trip, and I can't wait to work directly with students who will build and test designs that will explore microgravity, said Baxter. Our goal is to inspire them, and I'm sure their ideas will inspire us. NASA is also seeking volunteers to help judge the entries. U.S. residents with expertise in engineering, space, and or atmospheric research who are interested in reviewing NASA TechRise submissions can apply to be a judge here. For challenge details, visit www.futureengineers.org slash NASA TechRise. That's www.foxtrot uniform tango uniform romeo echo echo november golf india november echo echo romeo sierra dot o r g slash november alpha sierra alpha tango echo charlie hotel romeo india sierra echo. NASA Flight Opportunities Program, based at the agency's Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, California, manages the challenge. The program is part of NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. The Rare Historical Photos website carries the story of the 1949 Radio Hat. In 1949, Victor Hoflich held a press conference to introduce the Man from Mars Radio Hat. Hoflich knew a picture would tell the story better than words, so he had several teenagers modelling the radio hats for the reporters and the photographers. Soon, pictures and stories appeared in newspapers coast to coast across the USA. Newspaper articles typically included a photo of a young lady wearing the hat and a six-paragraph story. Although the radio hat had a futuristic appearance at the time, this was in fact due to technical limitations. While the transistor had been invented in 1947, it was still experimental and not widely available. The hat's radio relied on two vacuum tubes, and hopefully made the tubes a prominent feature, as well as the loop aerial. The tuning knob sat between the two valves. The battery was carried in the user's pocket. The radio hat was sold in department stores and by mail order. A. Van Nice, the Californian service station chain, sold the hats as a promotional item to customers who purchased gasoline. The radio hat retailed for $7.95. Designed in the style of a pith helmet, it could be ordered in eight colours. Lipstick red, canary yellow, blush pink, rose pink, tangerine, flamingo, chartreuse and tan. Later, seven more colour options were added. The massive publicity did not lead to lasting sales. Advertisements for the radio hat stopped in early 1950. Its failure was primarily due to technical limitations. It had only two valves, whilst household radios featured five or six and thus performed better. The loop antenna was directional and signal could be lost as the user turned his or her head. 
The radio hat had an advertised range of 20 miles. Sometimes when tuning, it picked up stations further away, but these would be received as an annoying squeal, as the hat did not have the necessary circuitry. In a 1956 interview, Hoflich said that the company still got orders for the hat, even though it had been long out of production. The radio hat was manufactured by American Mary Lay Corporation of Brooklyn, New York. Battery-operated portable radios had been available for many years, but Hoflich hoped that a radio with innovative packaging and a publicity campaign could be a runaway success. You can see many amazing photographs and read the full article at rarehistoricalphotos.com. It's well worth a look. The Raspberry Pi is an amazing open source device. Technology hobbyists implement it in many projects, from sending instant messages to making retro video games. The All Free DP website reports that the Raspberry Pi is being used for projects for a hobby that some may be unfamiliar with, that's amateur radio. Worldwide, there are about 3 million amateur radio operators, often referred to as hams. They communicate over designated radio frequencies using two-way radios, homemade equipment, antennas, repeaters, the internet, and even satellites orbiting the Earth. Recently, many amateur radio operators have been incorporating Raspberry Pis into their projects. This is because these little single board computers have many benefits, including being easy to implement and they're portable, eliminating the need for heavy, stationary and expensive equipment. Thanks to something called software-defined radio, single board computers can be used for radio communications. In the article, 10 cool ham radio projects are described that use the Raspberry Pi. It should be mentioned that if you plan on making some of these projects, you will need to follow your local radio laws, especially when transmitting over the airwaves. The projects mentioned include an SDR scanner. With this project, you can monitor and display information about radio signals, such as their intensity along with the frequency. There's a radio room clock project, where you can create a clock that tells you not only the time, but also the weather, solar flux data, DX spot reporting, locations of satellites, including the International Space Station, and all on a touch screen interface. There are instructions on how to use a Raspberry Pi to build a pirate radio transmitter. It's only very low power, by the way, so it won't upset anyone. A satellite tracker project can help your antennas to keep pointing at moving satellites. There's a full home weather station, an amateur radio repeater station, and a design called R2 Cloud, which will receive satellite images and data streams. There's instructions on how to build a budget security camera system using slow-scan amateur radio television signals and an advanced full-blown drone construction project, which includes an amateur radio repeater just for fun. And there's also instructions for a really simple Morse code sender and reader, whether you plan to do this automatically or with a real Morse key. You can read all about these Raspberry Pi construction projects at all3dp.com. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network page to register, check on upcoming webinars, ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Introduction to DMR and Digital Voice by Tim Deegan, KJ8U, will be presented on Thursday, September 9, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930. UTC. An introductory overview of digital voice technologies for ham radio. Focus on DMR with notes on System Fusion, D-Star, and other digital voice modes. Description of digital voice architecture components and the interesting opportunities as well as the challenges it presents amateur radio operators will be covered. Working the Pile Up, presented by Ron Del Pierre Smith. KD9 IPO is scheduled for a presentation on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Ron Del Pierre Smith, KD9 IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL Assistant Section Manager in Illinois, will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in field day, contesting, 
special events, or rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Ron will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change, so check the Learning Network webinar page for the latest schedule updates. The Hackaday website has reported on a project by Tom S. N. Pries, Kilo Bravo 9 Echo November Sierra, which uses surplus 60 milliliter syringes to make a variable inductor and a variable capacitor for amateur radio use. Amateur radio as a hobby has a long history of encouraging experimentation using whatever one might have at hand. When Tom wanted to use his 14 MHz antenna outside of its designated frequency range, he knew he'd need an impedance matching circuit. The most common type is an L-match circuit, which uses a variable capacitor and a variable inductor to adjust the usable frequency range, the resonance, of the antenna. While inefficient in some specific configurations, they excel at bridging the gap between the 50 ohm impedance of the radio and the unknown impedance of an antenna. While no doubt raiding his junk box for parts, Tom hacked together a variable capacitor and inductor using ferrite rods from AM radios, hot glue, magnet wire, copper tape and some surplus 60 milliliter plastic syringes. With the syringes, he ground out the center of the plunger to make room for a ferrite rod. Winding the outside of the syringe with magnet wire, the alignment of the ferrite rod could be adjusted via the plunger, changing the characteristics of the element to tune the circuit. Tom reports he was able to make an on-air contact using his newly made tuner, and we're sure he enjoyed putting his improved equipment to use. You can read the full Hackaday post at hackaday.com. The story itself is called Surplus Syringes Make Satisfactory Tuner for Amateur Radio Experimentation. The following is a parody, and not to be taken seriously. And finally this week, for years it has been believed that electric bulbs emitted light. However, recent information from Bell Labs has proven otherwise. Electric bulbs don't emit light, they suck dark. Thus, they now call these bulbs dark suckers. The dark sucker theory, according to a spokesman from the labs, proves the existence of dark, that dark has mass heavier than that of light, and that dark is faster than light. Again, the basis of the dark sucker theory is that electric bulbs suck dark. Take, for example, the dark suckers in the room where you are. There is less dark right next to them than there is elsewhere. The larger the dark sucker, the greater its capacity to suck dark. Dark suckers in a parking lot have a much greater capacity than the ones in your room. As with all things, dark suckers don't last forever. Once they are full of dark, they can no longer suck. This is proven by the black spot on a full dark sucker. A new candle has a white wick. You'll notice that after the first use, the wick turns black, a byproduct of all the dark which has been sucked into it. If you hold a pencil next to the wick of an operating candle, the tip will turn black because it got in the path of the dark flowing into the candle. Unfortunately, these primitive dark suckers have a very limited range. There are also portable dark suckers. The bulbs in these can't handle all the dark by themselves and must be aided by a dark storage unit. When the dark storage unit is full, it must be either emptied or replaced before the portable dark sucker can operate again. This theory postulates that dark has mass. When dark goes into a dark sucker, friction from this mass generates heat. Thus, it is not wise to touch an operating dark sucker. Candles present a special problem as the dark must travel in the solid wick instead of through glass. This generates a great amount of heat. Thus, it can be very dangerous to touch an operating candle. Dark is also heavier than light. If you swim deeper and deeper, you notice it gets darker and darker. When you reach a depth of approximately 50 feet, you're in total darkness. This is because the heavier dark sinks to the bottom of the lake while the lighter light floats to the top. The immense power of dark can be utilized to our advantage. For example, we can collect the dark that is settled to the bottom of lakes and push it through turbines, which generates electricity and helps push it to the ocean where it may safely be stored. Prior to turbines, it was much more difficult to get dark from rivers and lakes to the ocean. The early settlers recognized this problem and tried to solve it. When on a river, or in a canoe traveling in the same direction as the flow of dark, they paddled slowly, so as to not stop the flow of dark. But when they traveled against the flow of dark, they paddled quickly, so as to help push the dark along its way. Finally, we must prove that dark is faster than light. If you stand in an illuminated room in front of a closed dark closet, then slowly open the door, you would see the light slowly enter the closet. But since the dark is so fast, you would not be able to see the dark leave the closet. In conclusion, Bell Labs theory has stated that dark suckers make all our lives much easier. 
So the next time you look at a light bulb, remember that it is indeed a dark sucker. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.